Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to take a look and listen to the revamped Bit8 device that's bundled inside of Bitwig Studio. Uh, the previous version of this plugin or this device was basically just these two things here. Okay, and how those two worked in tandem. And it's still a very powerful effect, but as you can see, there's almost two times, three times, maybe even more than that, um, options, combinations with some of these different settings that we can work with in order to um, further color our sound. And that's really what distortion is. It's a type of coloration, whether it's analog or digital. And in the past, maybe 10 years ago, the whole concept of digital distortion was so terrifying. I think it was drilled into every like new young computer music producer that like digital distortion is something that you need to run away from and be terrified from. And nowadays, I don't think that that same message is, is put so harshly on people, mainly because we're working in an environment where if we go over zero here, the DAW is smart enough to like kind of adjust for us. We work at 32 bit floating point um, bit depth, and that allows us to actually go way past these meters and not get into that digital distortion territory. And there's so many safeguards now built into your systems where um, when I was first doing music production, it was really important that you turned on your music, um, or sorry, you turned on your audio interface and your speakers in the right order. You turned things off in the right order to guarantee that you didn't get some form of like crazy digital distortion that could potentially break your system, break your speakers, break your audio interface. Nowadays, I don't even really think about that much. I kind of turn things on and off however I want to, and I never get that like digital feedback that you would get in the past if you made those sorts of mistakes. All that being said, I still think people just in, inherently think that, you know, digital distortion bad, analog distortion good, and that's not the way to think. It's just different types of colors. And I think nowadays, too, with music production, a lot of popular productions like that OVO Drake sound, they use a lot of bit crushing, digital distortion. And as we go through this video, we'll explain all of these parameters and these controls to show you how you can go um, from something very subtle to something extreme. So as long as you understand what's going on, you shouldn't be afraid of this device and you should be ready to use it. But like with everything, always have an intention, have a reason for why you're using it. So enough of me ranting, let's get into the video. This is what we're gonna be working with. Especially listen to those hi-hats. You can hear that the just overall fidelity is being reduced. And now this is actually very interesting. When we stop it, we're starting to see a lot of peaking and things like that happening. We'll explain all of that as we go on. The first thing I want to do is I want to bring this back to an initialized state or in this case, bring it back to where we're not hearing any kind of an effect at all. I know digital distortion is about fidelity. So if we turn any of these knobs, the idea is that we're bringing down the fidelity. We're actually causing errors to occur in the digital DSP signal path, so to speak. And again, we will talk about this more as we go on, but let's start from the right and work our way back to the left. So we have first this little quantize area, and I'm guessing that this knob is what's controlling the amount of that. So we can just listen. If it makes it more crazy, if it gives it more distortion, we need to turn the knob the other way. So let's just take a listen. Oh yeah, that's definitely doing something. So let's pull it back the other way. We also can see that that little indicator is turned off. Bitwig has gotten so good at giving you visual feedback. It's unbelievable. So now that is having no effect whatsoever. This shape area, let's just listen to this. I'm guessing that this isn't impacting the sound, but oh, that is, that is. So let's go back to our regular signal. Then we also have this gate message, which I'm guessing is gonna work similar to the quantize. If I pull it to the right, that's really degrading the signal. If I pull it to the left, very nice. And in this case, this is actually working the opposite way. When this yellow indicator is on, that's telling me that signal is passing through unaffected. And then we get down to our last little area here. All right, we have a what looks like almost a cutoff uh, frequency. And like usual with these, when if you're using a traditional low pass anyway, as I pull it to the left, it's going to degrade. If I 
pull it to the right, it should bring that fidelity back. We're hearing a nice, clean and clear audio signal. And right now it's having no effect, but let's just look at these last two controls. So jitter, my guess is I want zero jitter. Jitter would mean that there's something being modulated, something's being affected. If I pull it all the way up or I bring it out right now, it's probably not gonna have much of a, a difference, but I'm just gonna go 0% to be safe. And then we have this chance knob, this clock chance. And let's see what happens if I pull this to the left. Oop, that's crackling up the signal. So I'm gonna wanna bring that all the way back to the right. Okay, and now if we turn this on and off, no effect whatsoever. Now that we're back in an initialized state, we can start to pick this device apart one knob at a time, beginning here with clock frequency. And if we want, we can bring up our help tips just so we can see what this says. So clock frequency is referring to sample rate. So let's talk about sample rate a little bit. In the digital domain with digital audio, um, every single audio source that's recorded has to be set within certain boundaries or need to be recording settings so that the computer knows just how hi-fi we want it to be. Now, if we go in here and we look at our preferences and let's go to audio here, you see we have sample rate. And by default, my audio interface just puts this to automatic. So I'd have to go back and look at my audio interface settings to see where that's set. But if you notice, we could choose one of these, 44.1 all the way up to 192. And depending on your interface, you may not have this many options, but the theorem, the Nyquist theorem, is that if you want to get like your full fidelity, you need to record in at twice your highest value. Okay, and so with our human hearing, we can hear from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. So in theory, as long as our sample rate is at least at 40,000, we should be getting the full spectrum. Some people will tell you if you go to these higher sampling rates, they can hear a difference, they can hear better in the highs. Personally, I don't work above 48K, and the reason for that is, um, when CDs were really popular, pretty much everything was done at 44.1 and millions of CDs were sold. It's only when you get into like the hi-fi community where you wanna go higher than this. And the other thing to remember is like, if you go in and you look at like any audio sample, like I'll just grab whatever, we can see here what this is recorded at. So you can see this is 44.1 in mono at 24 bit. A lot of the Bitwig stuff, I think is 44.1, 24 bit, there you go again. And sometimes this might say 16 bit and we'll get to that in a little bit. But just remember, if I pull this in at 44 one, even if I like upsample it and then I'm using, let's say 96 K that is still going to be 44 one. That was what it was recorded at. You can't change that. Now certain plugins or whatever might work a little bit harder if it can see that that signal is now like 96 K, but for the most part, it makes absolutely no difference. So I always recommend that people either work at 44 one or 48, unless you're really, really anal and trying to go like super high fi Now, why does any of this matter? Well, the reason is this clock for frequency is referring directly to that sample rate, that sample frequency, okay, that you set um, early on or you set for a recording, which just means if we're following the Nyquist theorem, we're not expecting to hear any kind of an effect until we get down below 40K. Okay, and even then we may not really hear anything until we get into like 30s or, or whatever. It depends on how good your system is, how good your hearing is. But let's just start to pull this back and see if that's true. Now we start to hear truly what almost sounds like a low pass filter when we're here at 23.5. You can hear all that high end just completely goes away. And this is actually a common trick that is used by producers they wanna kind of like de-harsh the signal a little bit. And what this is actually doing is it's imagining that when you recorded this, or if you had an audio source, it was not recorded at that full fidelity, that it was actually brought down a little bit. And that's the effect that it's having. It's creating an error and thus creating a distortion effect. Okay, and in this case, it basically is just taming those high frequencies. So if we go down really low, you can imagine what's gonna happen, okay? Our low end should pretty much be unaffected, but our high end is gonna to continue to distort. And now 
just like uh, the basic law of like energy, you know, energy can't be created or destroyed. That energy in the signal is still there. Those frequencies are still there. It just can't represent it accurately. And that's the distortion that you're hearing. That's the error that you're hearing. Okay, so when we pull that down. Listen to our low end. It still sounds pretty good. But basically this is telling me that it, it can't even record anything at 1.5K or above accurately. And so that's why you hear the effect that you hear. But still listen to that kick drum. That's still pounding through just fine. And there's a low sub bass that's happening as well. Okay, so that is how the clock frequency works. Um, again, the further you pull to the left, the more extreme the effect is gonna be, the more frequencies that when this when this audio source is trying to be read and analyzed by the computer, that like analog to a digital conversion stage, we're getting more and more errors, okay? Now that we have a really good understanding of what's happening with the clock, we can talk about the jitter. And if we read our help tips, the jitter is just going to tell us the amount of fluctuation inserted to the clock frequency. So what that means is what we'll get, instead of it just staying consistent at this 5.56, if we bring up the jitter, it's going to bounce that around a little bit. And you'll hear it just adds a little bit of excitement, a little bit of sizzle to the sound. could simulate something like that by just going in and like grabbing a random and putting that random onto the clock frequency would be like a way to do it okay we want it moving both directions and let's listen to this this will be a little bit more extreme because it's bouncing to both sides it's not doing it smoothly we'll just have it only moving actually get more interesting effects by using the random here than you would by using the jitter, but you can put them in combination. And we could actually set this at the same thing. This is going to sound really crazy. 4.52, please. Or something like it. And that actually is going to sound pretty similar to what the jitter sounds like when we put the jitter all the way up. Okay, so that's more or less what jitter's doing. Let's get rid of that and just listen to it with the jitter. Okay, and then last but not least, we have chance. Chance is an interesting one. Um, and let's go ahead and let's read that tooltip again. So chance says the percentage of samples selected at random that will be heard. So that's basically just telling us like if we bring this way down, we're expecting that the digital signal, or sorry, the digital system is gonna have a tougher time actually even just taking some of those samples. So you might hear some longer bits of distortion or just more aggressive distortion when we start to pull chance down. just more errors and we can combine that with jitter and if we go all the way down to zero we're just going to hear silence the lower we go the fewer samples are being read and the more errors are occurring and at really low values you can basically simulate like the distortion sound that you might get out of a vinyl record or something Bring it down real low. So something like that could be cool if you combined it with an EQ and just tried to get like the high end type sizzle. And in fact, we could actually just do that if we added dither and that's a noise. Oh boy, that's not gonna work though. have to combine it with an EQ. 
But yeah, you can get some cool kind of vinyl-y, glitchy type sounds just by setting up a bit eight onto a complex audio source like we have here, okay? Or you could put it onto a white noise and then you would get like some more variation. Of course, you would probably wanna EQ it at the end. We are jumping ahead of ourselves a little bit though. That is first and foremost, that clock setting. So that means more like in terms of the frequency spectrum. Okay, so the 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, that's what it's really listening to and impacting. You can hear that there's some amplitude modulation that's occurring, but it's not really responding to or hearing amplitude variation. It's listening more for the frequencies. Okay, and as we pull that down, it's giving us errors at everything at half that value and above. So if we were at 4K, that would be 2K and above. It's having a hard time. It's gonna produce an error and then a distortion sound that comes out of it. Moving right along, we now come to this gate setting. Gate is going to refer to amplitude, okay? And when we refer to amplitude, we're talking about bit depth. Right now in our DAW, you can see that we have this really wide range. It goes all the way down to infinity, and it actually goes all the way up to infinity. And when you're working in the DAW and you're working at 32-bit floating point bit depth, we don't really get those digital distortion errors, and we can hear the sound clearly at all times. There's no distortion that occurs when it fades out. That's usually the issue, okay? That's the issue in early digital recordings and early CDs, is that there's only so much dynamic range Okay, but when it gets below that dynamic range, it's going to cause an error. It still has data there, but it doesn't know how to handle it, and so it produces an error. Right now, when we look at this, we're at minus 96 dB. If you've noticed, when I hit stop, oh, we gotta get rid of this. Sorry about that. That when I stop the signal, okay, this is actually kind of showing us amplitude. We can no longer hear it, but once it gets down below minus 96 dB, because the signal is still playing, there's a delay tail, it's starting to cause a distortion. We can't hear that, though, because it's below our range of human hearing. If our dynamic range was only 40, and let's bring this up to 40 just so I can show you, we are going to expect to see that come in a little bit sooner, and you might be able to even hear the error. Okay, so it starts to come in a lot sooner and we can hear the effect that it has as it goes and it fades out. The way that you'd actually be able to hear what's happening though is if we bring in a tool device and right as we pause and we start to see that come up, we bring the amplitude up. We'll be able to hear what's happening. And this was the issue with CDs and fades early on was people didn't really know well, I mean, they knew why it was occurring. It was just a hard thing to get rid of until the systems became stronger. So that's digital distortion that's occurring. Once it drops below that 40 dB, we're hearing errors. And again, that's energy that it has to be distributed somewhere. It has to go somewhere, and it ends up being a glitching, glitchy type sound. So if we bring this way up, what that's going to tell us is every time that that signal is dropping, or sorry, yeah, anytime that signal is, let's say, dropping below 20 dB, it's going to shoot out an error. But notice that you can still hear the peaks really clearly. So you hear kind of a buzzing for all the information below, but above it's having no issues. If we go way up though, we're gonna start to just distort the whole signal. And because, let's see what we're peaking at right now. Because we're peaking at minus 6.6, .6, once we get into that kind of like near that, that value, it's just gonna sound like nothing because it, it, it can't accurately represent anything. can completely destroy your signal. But notice that our overall peak value is more or less um, left exactly the same. Because again, energy can't just be destroyed or, you know, on its own. It has to still go somewhere. Um, so that is how the gate message is working there. It's more like bit depth. So if we think about a cassette or something, that dynamic range was usually around 40. Um, but again, on an analog medium, you're not getting a digital distortion artifact. It's just limiting the dynamic range. So it's not like we're necessarily emulating that, but we are going to hear a distortion. And then we could also bring this clock frequency down, imagining that we didn't have full fidelity. So we could bring this down to like 25 or something, add a tiny bit of jitter. And this is a way to kind of lo-fi out your sound. Not a huge impact. 
but an impact. Okay, so that is how our gate message is working. That's how that module uh, works. So far, we've looked at the clock section, which is correlated to frequency and sample rate. So if we go down to like 10K, what that's telling us is there are going to be errors produced for any frequency that's coming in that is above 5K. That's the Nyquist theorem. And we can hear that like so. Okay, we've also looked at this gate section, which is telling us that if I have this at minus 25, there's gonna be errors, errors occurring anywhere below 25 dB. Okay, any signal that comes in that's below that, it's gonna have a hard time um, analyzing that properly. And thus we get those artifacts that we hear. And the big difference between digital and analog distortion is that with the analog distortion, there's a harmonic component to it because whatever mechanism exists inside that amplifier or inside that recording device, when it's overworked, when you go in too hot, it's literally like those mechanisms, they're like vibrating. They're vibrating relative to the sound waves that are hitting them. And when they get worked over, those mechanisms like vibrate in sort of like a self-oscillation, sort of a, a sympathetic way so that the distortion, the overtones that exist are related to the signal. They're directly related to the signal and you get a harmonic type of distortion. I apologize if that was a horrible way of explaining it, but that's the best way to explain it. In the digital domain, it's data. It doesn't understand that when the system can't produce that, it's not going to react in the same kind of way. Those artifacts that are produced aren't going to be necessarily harmonic. Now, we can hear that there's a logic to it. Like you can kind of hear the different timbres of these distortions. It's just not going to be harmonic. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use it. It just means that you have to pick and choose your spots. Digital distortion is used all the time with like drum sounds or sounds that aren't harmonic. It's also used all the time with like basses, like really low basses. Um, because sometimes you can then produce a little bit of a sizzle on top that you don't have otherwise. And it's still going to kind of go with that amplitude curve. There's still like an envelope follower attached to it. It's just going to be non-harmonic. But you can still lock it into sound good or you can do a combination of both. Uh, electric guitars, electric basses. Really, you can try it on anything but it is gonna be something that you have to pick and choose your spots for. Okay, so that's our little review of what we've covered so far. Next, we move into shape. And again, this is something unique to the digital domain, unique timbres, things that we can do in the computer that we can't really do in analog. So right now we can see on this transfer function, I think that's what it's called, my math is terrible. We are going both above and below a middle line. Okay, that's our middle line right there. And it sounds good. One thing we can do is we can force all those samples, all the little bits of recorded information that are below to come up onto that line. And that's what this half mode does. Negative values become zero. And let's, he let's hear the effect. Okay, it's a unique effect. Go back to our regular. And then we have the full, which is actually gonna make this a busier signal. It's gonna take all these values underneath, flip them up above. And if we had a really like crazy stereo signal, like really big difference between the left and the right, we would see how busy this would become. And it is getting busier, but remember, there's still a lot of information that's mono. But like with those delays, with that stereo delay, it's, it's, it's really making an interesting effect. And those are the effects like so. Okay, and having this oscilloscope does a great job of visualizing what's going on. Uh, Bitwig Studio has gotten just so good from a learning perspective. This is the part that I always geek out over with this program is it's gone so good from a learning perspective. You can visualize everything that's happening and it helps you understand that people like me are no longer, you don't really need me anymore. You could definitely self-teach yourself this program. Okay, moving on, we have a clip mode. So as we talked about before, this gate is referring to stuff falling below a threshold, okay? The clock is referring to frequency. A clipper is referring to what happens above a certain threshold, okay? So you can almost imagine that we normally have a peak limiter, and this peak limiter is actually trying to react in more of an analog way, which just means that when we go over threshold, let's put a little lower ceiling so we can get an effect happening sooner. When we go over this threshold, you 
it is going to distort. Let me just turn this off as well just to be super safe here. You can hear that it is distorting the signal, but it's trying really, really hard to do it in a non-audible way. It's trying to be transparent as much as possible. Now, of course, when you pump it in too hard, there's still that data, there's still that information. Energy just can't be destroyed, but it's trying its best to redistribute that information, that overdriven information into a harmonic context so that it still sounds good. With a clipper, it doesn't work the same way, okay? This is definitely not like a soft clipper effect. This is gonna be a hard clip on either side. So basically what we're doing with the clip is it flat lines it. It's gonna like really square it out. You're gonna hear an aggressive effect when I start to use this clipper. And it will work right away. You don't even have to really overdrive. It's gonna automatically force the signal up above. And you can see that we've completely bottomed out any kind of dynamic range. But I do believe that the gate is like reacting first. Okay, so like if we can distort underneath, we can then distort over top as well. So let's get this working first. And then combine the clipper. And so we should expect to see a line going above and a line going below. But it is kind of evening out that effect a little. Really grimy. Let's take away this gate. And then you can hear how much clarity we get underneath. So very cool effect. And if you just tickle... I hate using that verb, but if you just tickle both of these little indicators, you'll get a subtle effect that kind of lo-fies out your sound a little bit. All right, so last but not least, oh, let's listen to the other modes. The other modes are just really, really aggressive, okay? So let's listen to the other modes here. It's just a choice. Really boxy and tinny. It's just a question of how it's redistributing those errors. Okay. I'm not sure when you would use this unless you were doing some glitch out type stuff. And even then you'd have to be kind of careful. All right, so those are the three different clip modes. So again, we're thinking gate, below a threshold, clip, imagine it more like a peak limiter. And there are soft clippers on the market that um, some people really swear by compared to limiters, like they like the way the clipper sounds, but just be aware that there is a difference. So when you really kind of want to hear um, a clear and obvious distortion on your peaks, you will go clip. When you don't want to hear that as much, you're going to go with a limiter, okay? A limiter that's trying to be transparent. So last but not least, we're going to come into this quantize mode. And this one's interesting because until we combine it with the gate, it is just going to kind of happen at all times. So it's not really following the signal as much in terms of kind of bouncing up and down if we've heard before. So let's just go ahead and listen to it. And we're going to talk about it as we do. So we're on off zero currently. My guess is we're not going to hear an effect again until like we heard before with the gate. So that's at minus 16.3. I just want you to listen to that for, for a few seconds. And now let's put the gate to minus 16.3. So you get what I'm saying? So a lot of times what I find with bit with this bit, uh, excuse me with this bit crusher is trying to kind of dial these in together to get a really kind of cool movie effect, uh, moving effect. And what the quantize is doing, if you just search like quantize definition, I think a good picture will come up. What it's basically trying to do for us, and let's look at the show help really quick. I'm on the wrong device. That never helps. On the show help, what we're gonna see is these images on zero, diffusion, and dither, okay? And with those, that's basically telling us how we're trying to distribute the errors that are coming in. 
So do we want the arrows to fall off zero? Do we want the errors to fall on zero? You just have to listen to the difference. Do we want to diffuse the errors? That's pretty much as you would expect, like diffusing a sound, like a reverb spreading out. You'll definitely hear that one. And then dither, we'll get to at the end. Dither is something that um, was invented basically to try to prevent that CD quality from uh, you being able to hear the distortion on like fade outs and stuff. So it's a little bit of randomized noise that gets thrown into the system, that gets thrown into the signal to try and uh, break up some of those little distortion-y bits. So I'll explain that to you guys. I'll show it to you. It'll probably make more sense in context than me just talking about it. But let's go through here. Let's listen to the differences. So this is off zero. And we also have this square domain which I find it just kind of locks it in a little bit more. Kind of makes it seem a little more under control to me. I'm sure there's a really obvious mathematical thing that's going on, but that's the sound that it produces. Here's on zero. Let's do diffusion. We also have a brightness control, kind of telling us where we want to put those errors. And that is self-explanatory. The last one we have is dither, which is just going to sound like a noise. And we can put that into stereo. And notice that our thing is actually moving with how loud or how soft I make it. And that's why it is really important that we combine it with the gate if we want something to have more of like an envelope follower effect. That sounds really cool. Okay, so what I would like to do right now is I'm going to actually try and just lock in something that just is going to kind of lo-fi out this loop a little bit. This would be a practical example. This is a way of lo-fying your sound, decreasing the fidelity without like really going overboard and going crazy. And I know this is an effect that um, I think one of Drake's producers talks about using all the time to get that iconic sound. I know there's more going on than just that, but this is one of the ways that they try to lo-fi it out. And of course, they're not going to do it on his voice, or I don't think they do it on his voice, but for some of the drums and some of like the pads and stuff that they have going in the background, part of the OVO sound is doing this. And it's actually a very popular technique in modern production. So let's go ahead and let's try to lock something in. I am going to end up using um, dither eventually, but for now, let's just turn that off. Let's start with the clock. So I'm going to take this to around like 35 or so. I just want to barely hear it working. Let's make it a little more obvious. It actually makes it sound clearer, <laughs> which is interesting. Let's add a tiny bit of jitter. Maybe it's like 5%. And we'll just bring the chance down by a tiny bit again, like 95. And ironically, you know, your ears, and this is, I don't want to go too deep into this, but your ears actually like imperfections. So a digital signal is just almost too perfect. So, and, and right now I haven't really put anything on and like what I would normally do, I don't normally use this technique. What I would normally do would be to use more of like an analog emulated effect to get this, but this will work just fine as well. Okay, so with the gate, I'm just gonna have it tickle it. So I'm gonna try to go right to around minus 40. Here, if it's too dramatic. Okay, I'm fine with that. And then what goes below, let's try to average that out. We're gonna, not that much, we're gonna clip it by just maybe 1 dB. Okay, and then the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add in some dither. 
And the effect I'm looking for is to smooth that out so that when we fade, we don't hear that quite as obviously. I always use, I like this square domain thing. It just makes it sound a little better. And we're gonna bring this right to around 40 as well. It might be too loud though. Because remember, we are just bringing in some noise. I can start to hear it already. And in theory, we shouldn't be bringing up the peak here at all. I just want to make sure we're not getting tricked by any additional gain. Yeah, 0.1 dB because of the noise I think we brought in. So let's make this extreme so you can hear it and hear how I bring it out. Let's listen when it fades out at the end. Let's see if it's as extreme as it was before. Hmm. That's still kind of bad, actually. Let's see if I bring it up to 40, what it does. That was a little bit better, but we can still hear it. It sounds a little cleaner. I'm just going to, I'm going to bring it down a little bit more. So I don't like the sound of it. Let's just add a tool device just so at the very end, when it's fading to zero, we can hear how aggressive that is. Yeah, that's still pretty, that's still pretty audible because normally what you would do is you would be dithering right at the very end. And whenever you're down sampling, it's often encouraged that you're going to dither. So let's see if we have our export. Maybe if I hit file export, we can, that's how we'll see it. Um, export audio. You'll see that we have a dither option. And typically I don't use this because what I'll do is I'll export at 24 bit and then dithering really is not gonna make much of a difference. If you're down sampling from like 32 bit to 16 bit, you might wanna put that on, but honestly, it's gonna take a really special set of ears to hear the difference. Um, I'm sure some people in the comments will disagree with me on that, but for your average listener, that really doesn't matter. And it's only really something you would consider doing when you're downsampling because it is gonna be less information on the export. So there might be digital artifacts that come in, whether or not you can hear them, you know, I'll just leave it at that. So this is how your digital distortion, your Bit8 device inside of Bitwig Studio works. I hope this has been helpful for you guys. It's obvious, I hope now, how you can get extreme effect, extreme, holy crap, extreme effects versus subtle effects. I'm getting so excited, I'm stumbling over words. It's right back to how it was a few years ago. So <laughs> thank you guys for watching and I hope you'll be back for another video soon. Take care.